Our Bible text today comes from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Have you ever wondered, why doesn't Jesus use his power to make the world a better place? If he is who he says he is and he can do what some claim he can do, why doesn't he use his ability to change the awful circumstances we often face in life? And why doesn't he just do away with people who promote ungodly morals and behaviors? Can't he just, you know, snap his fingers or do something and wipe out those who attack God's people? Well, those are not new thoughts. These are the very questions that were in the minds of the people gathered on Palm Sunday that welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So let's set the stage for our text. Uh, there's excitement in the air. Uh, we read that there is a feast going on in verse 12, and that feast is Passover. It is the holiest time of year for all the Israelites. Uh, many have descended on Jerusalem, and depending on the historical numbers, we look at anywhere between a half a million to two and a half million people are in Jerusalem. Now, the name of Jesus is on everyone's lip. Jesus has gone viral. He is known as a miracle worker, and the recent resurrection of Lazarus from the dead has really, as you can imagine, has spread. So Jesus, he's He's on his way to Jerusalem for the Passover. Uh, the crowd hears about this, and in their excitement, masses of them go out to the you know, outskirts of Jerusalem to welcome him as he rides into the city. And it's a wild and, and crazy celebration. Everyone is praising the name of Jesus. It's so loud that some of the even religious authorities come out and tell Jesus he needs to like settle them down and calm them down. It's, you know, getting out of control and it's causing a public disturbance. And we often think when we think about Palm Sunday, like what a great day that was. I mean, for once, the crowds finally figured it out. Like, they're giving Jesus his due. They're praising him. They're glorifying him. Uh, you know, they're worshiping him. They're welcoming him in. And uh, so we think of this as like a great day for Jesus. Uh, and this is a great moment in, in the, you know, the gospel story. Uh, unfortunately, though, the, the whole thing, all of Palm Sunday was a giant misunderstanding. It was a huge epic misunderstanding, because when Jesus enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he is entering as the misunderstood Messiah. Jesus is completely misunderstood. So let's talk about that. Now with Palm Sunday in our text today, there are really two competing images that are set against each other. 
in the Palm Sunday story. Now the first image is the palms. We see in verse 13 that the people took out branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. Now we take for granted that there's palm branches and palm you know, leaves used on Palm Sunday. Why is that? Because palm branches have absolutely nothing to do with Passover, the feast that they're there you know, to celebrate. It has nothing at all to do with Passover. So why the palm branches? Well, for the past 200 years or so in Israel's history, palm branches were a symbol of Jewish nationalism. It would kind of be like their national flag, palm branches. Because prior to Jesus um, in his earthly life and ministry, um, there were Syrians who had invaded and there were a group of uh, Israelites who drove them out of the country and, you know, drove them out of the temple. And when they returned back to Jerusalem, people welcomed them with palm branches. Even after Jesus's uh, earthly life and ministry, uh, there was a, a kind of a rebel government that was set up to oppose the Romans. And they even minted their own currency. Uh, and guess what was the emblem on the the coins that they had minted, palm branches. Palm branches were the symbol of Jewish independence. Um, It became uh, also associated with a conqueror or conquerors who would throw out the foreign occupiers. This is what the crowds have in mind on Palm Sunday. They're waving their branches because Jesus, who is this powerful miracle worker who had come from God, uh, who could raise the dead, surely he was the long-awaited Savior who would lead the Israelites in regaining the national independence they had lost centuries before. They had been dominated by the Babylonians and then the Persians and then the Greeks and now the Romans for for centuries. And their hopes is that the Messiah, the Deliverer, God's great conqueror, he'd come at last, he would overthrow the Romans, and they would finally have their country back. And so we see that they're placing all their hope in Jesus, not by waving, just waving the palm branches, but also what they say. Uh, They quote Psalm 118, uh, we see in verse 13, where they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now, most of that is a quote of Psalm 118. Uh, The first part, Hosanna, means save us now. Uh, It's really a, a cry of deliverance. Jesus is coming in, they're waving their palm branches, and they're saying, save us now, deliver us, free us uh, right now. And then the next part, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was an oft-repeated phrase for the Israelites, and it was said so much and sung so much that it was almost like this um, national fight song for Jewish independence. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the, the great deliverer, the great conqueror. And so they're saying, save us now. They're singing the national fight song, and then they add this phrase onto the end, even the king of Israel. Now that has nothing at all to do with Psalm 118. That's just added in. That's kind of like the clincher. Save us now, singing the national fight song. And like, you're our king uh, here to save us. So for those who are in the crowds, this was a political and military rally. This was a political and military rally waving palm branches, chanting cries of deliverance. It would be something like this. Imagine it's uh, the outskirts of Paris uh, towards the end of World War II. They've been occupied by the Nazis for a few years, and British and U.S. tanks come rolling into town. The Nazis are uh, on the run, and the whole town comes out, and they're waving their French flags as they welcome in the liberators and uh, freedom has been restored. And that's 
that's what's kind of going on here. Jesus, he's riding into town and he's going to, you know, do what he needs to do. And he's going to use all his power and make things right. But Jesus was the misunderstood Messiah. The people were cheering for a fantasy. Um, they, they, were, they had made an, uh, an idol, a false image of who Jesus was, and that's who they were worshiping and praising. And, and they were celebrating a victory that Jesus had no real intention of giving them. Now, Jesus brings this misunderstanding into very sharp focus by the manner in which he enters Jerusalem. Now, this is kind of that second image. We've got the palms on one side, and here is uh, the image of Jesus riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. Now, conquerors and heroes would ride in on, on a war horse, or they would come in on a, on a mighty chariot. It would be a sign of power and authority. Uh, like if somebody showed up in a in a, you know, a motorcade with a uh, up-armored limo and security guards and, you know, armed personnel. And it was like just a show of force. Um, that's, that's what, you know, people would be expecting. And, and Jesus comes riding in on a donkey, which was the sign of somebody who came in peace. Now, this is actually something kings in the Old Testament like David and Solomon had done when they would enter into a town riding on a donkey. It was a sign of a royalty that was coming uh, not to make war, but to bring peace. So we see that the disciples themselves, they didn't really get it. Uh, John even says, at first, we did not understand these things. Uh, but later, and we'll talk about that, he goes, but later we got it. And when, when, when John gets it later, he sees that what Jesus did on Palm Sunday was fulfill uh, these words of an ancient prophecy from Zechariah 9. And the words of Zechariah 9 were about 500 years prior to Palm Sunday, prior to Jesus coming. And Zechariah wrote about this day when Israel's king would enter Jerusalem and would establish a throne forever, that would establish an eternal throne. So let's look at Zechariah uh, 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a, coat, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So looking at that text, we see that Jesus is described by the words righteous and humble. Jesus is righteous. He's righteous in his character and in who he is, and he's righteous in the way that he will rule. Uh, he will be a righteous king, a righteous ruler. Um, but also, he's very humble. The, the, the royalty that Jesus has will be characterized by humility and a gentleness of spirit. So, Jesus will achieve victory uh, in, as the king, setting up this eternal throne, not by violence, not by slaughter, not by dominating an enemy, not by oppressing people. Uh, it will not be by power or forced submission. He will come in peace. He will be righteous and he will be humble. Now, part of the uh, Zechariah 9 um, th that we need to look at is also the next verse. So 9 says he's coming righteous and humble. In verse 10, it says this. Look on your screen. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rules shall be from sea to sea. Now, what we see in this text is a description of what the Savior will do. Verse 9 tells us what he'll be. He'll be righteous and humble. And verse 10 says what he will do, and he will bring universal peace universal peace. So when the king enters into Jerusalem to set up his eternal throne, it will not just be for Israel, it'll be so much bigger. It will be for all people. It's going to be for the whole world. And he's going to rescue people from uh, the sin-stained world. And he's going to create a new world that will be free 
from sin, free from you know violence and anger and, and sickness and illness and death and rage and all these things. He's going to set up a, a whole new kingdom and peace to the nations and his rule will be sea to sea, the whole world. Now, the crowds, uh, as you can see by this point, didn't get what Jesus was about. They wanted Jesus to fix their immediate, you know, political and social problems, right? But Jesus was coming to give, uh, to offer an eternal solution to the sin problem that impacted the whole world. Uh, you know, they wanted Jesus to liberate them from the oppression of the Romans. Jesus came to provide the means of salvation for everybody and anybody who would believe. And instead of killing the enemy, Jesus would later that week allow himself to die on the cross at the hands of the enemy. Now, this epic misunderstanding explains the fickle nature of this crowd. Jesus rejected their offer for a war-bound king on Sunday. And as a result of that, the crowds would reject him and his kingdom of peace on Friday. He didn't want to be the kind of king um, they wanted him to be, and they rejected the kind of king he was offering himself as. So when we look at Palm Sunday, we see two very different ideas of who Jesus is. There's the palm branch Jesus, you know, the palm waving uh, conquering Jesus, and then there is the uh, Jesus riding on a donkey, the uh, righteous, humble, peace-loving, peace-bringing Jesus. And so uh, I have three questions for you, kind of now that we've kind of laid out what Palm Sunday was all about and these different ideas of who Jesus was. Um, and so I want you to think about it. First, I want you to think about what Jesus do you want? What Jesus do you want? Do you want the powerful Jesus of the palm branches, or do you want the peaceful Jesus uh, on the donkey? Now, you know, generally you and I, we like peace, right? Peace sounds good. We want peaceful lives. We want peace in the world. Um, but if, you know, I think we, we take a step back, there's also times where we want justice a whole lot more than we want peace. There are times when we feel like, you know, we're all for God's judgment, aren't we? Uh, times where we want Jesus to come just riding into the world uh, on his war horse, and he is going to set things straight. Jesus is going to take matters into his own hand, and, and yet he doesn't. He doesn't. You know, I think there's a good question here for us. Why didn't Jesus destroy the Romans? Why didn't he do what the crowds wanted? And, you know, his, historically, we know they were awful to the Israelites. And if Jesus did, you know, you know, bring the wrath down on them, like they had it coming, <laughs> like they totally would have had it coming, but he didn't do it. Why is that? Why wasn't he the, the Jesus of the palms? Because Jesus loved the Romans. He made them. He cared about them. And now he had come to save them in the rest of the world. You know, later on Friday, it was one of Jesus's executioners, one of the Roman soldiers who was right there, who had nailed him to the cross. And in seeing how Jesus bled and died and the words he spoke and the way he carried himself and seeing the sky turn dark and the earthquake and the rumbling and all that, uh, it was a Roman soldier who said, surely, this was the Son of God. And we see in that moment why Jesus did not, you know, just torch all the Romans. He came to save them too. Now, this is important for us, right? And I'll say if, if you're always looking for like a palm Sunday kind of Jesus, you're always going to be disappointed because that's not how he operates. Um, and if you're familiar with the story of Jonah, Jonah was really disappointed in God because 
God was sending him to go to Nineveh to, you know, preach a message of repentance. And they were awful people. They had done like the most horrific things and they were cruel. And, and Jonah didn't want to go because he said, oh, I know if I go, you're going to forgive them. That's why he didn't want to go. That's why he was running in the other way. And sure enough, Jonah goes and <laughs> preaches a message and God forgives them. That's who God is. And if we want the, 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 the conqueror Jesus, like we're going to be disappointed. And I think it's also important for us, we think about what kind of Jesus we want, that we need to remember that we were shown grace. Like Jesus gave us peace. Jesus rode into our lives, our sin-filled lives, right on a donkey. Um, and if God treated us the way that we deserve to be treated, like we'd all be dead. We'd all be subject to punishment. We'd all be heading to an eternity in hell. Like we don't really want God to come to us in justice. And, you know, we take again a step back and we look at the Israelites and the Romans. Were the Romans awful to the Israelites? Absolutely. But the Israelites were also guilty of a couple thousand years of disobedience to God. And their religious leaders were actively scheming at that moment to kill Jesus. And they would in a few days. They were no better than the Romans. And neither are we. We are no better. We all need a humble and gentle and righteous Savior who comes to seek to bring peace into our life. So what Jesus do you want? Second, what Jesus do you follow? What Jesus do you follow? You know, you and I are not dealing with uh, Roman occupation, uh, kind of like the Israelites of the day were, but we live in a time and a place where um, Christian values, our biblical values, we might say, are openly attacked. And it's so easy for us uh, as believers in Jesus to get caught up in culture wars, right? I mean, it's so easy to do that, especially around all these hot topic issues like abortion, uh, human sexuality, race, gun rights, immigration laws, all these kind of things, right? Now, are these important issues? Yes, they're very important. And as Christians, should we take the opportunities we have to speak truth into these situations? Yes, we totally should. God calls us to do that. But with that being said, we need to remember that Jesus did not come and offer his life on the cross to win a culture war in any age or in any civilization. That's not why Jesus came. He came to establish a kingdom that brings salvation to all who believe. He came back to roll back the curse of sin that has plagued this world since the Garden of Eden and to reunite humanity, all of us, with our Creator. Now, as disciples of Jesus, I think sometimes we lose our focus, right? We get caught up in the culture wars. Again, you and I, we are not here to make a slightly better moral version of a fallen world. That's not our task. That's not the Great Commission. What you and I are doing is making disciples of all nations. We're trying to do our part to usher in an eternal kingdom that will cross every line of division. My wife has said something that uh, has stuck with me, and uh, I really appreciate it. And as she's observed uh, different things in life, she said, she said, Sometimes, you know, we're, we're more focused about being right than making things right. And, you know, I've taken that to heart because I know that speaks truth to me, that I've worried so much about being right and making sure that I'm on the right side of something or that I let other people know that I'm right. And I'm not nearly as concerned about making things right, about, you know, getting other people in, in a, you know, in a better position or, or ministering or serving or, again, just making things right. And if you and I, if we lose our focus and about what we're really here to do is to make disciples, spread the gospel, 
um, usher in an eternal kingdom. If we're so caught up in arguing about what's right and wrong, then where is the world going to hear the gospel? Where, where are they going to you know, hear about Jesus? If we're so concerned about being right rather than making things right, um, how are they ever going to see this righteous, gentle, humble Savior riding up over the hill to save them? So what Jesus do you want? What Jesus are you following? Are you following the palm branch Jesus? Or are you following that humble, beautiful, gentle Savior who's come to make everything right? And then finally, what Jesus do you represent? What Jesus are you representing to the world? Is it the palm branch Jesus or the gentle, lowly Jesus on a donkey? Now, the disciples learned this lesson, right? Um, at first, they're joining in the fervor, right? They're, they're waving their palm branches. They're chanting Psalm 118, like they're in on it, right? This fits the character of the disciples. Um, what are they always asking Jesus about their positions of authority? When Jesus overthrows and the government and, and he's number one and he's the king, who's going to be number one? Who's going to be number two? Uh, at one point, James and John, uh, Jesus is rejected in the village and are like, Jesus, you want us to call down fire from heaven and just, you know, smite them all and, you know, blow them up. Uh, and Jesus says, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, when Jesus is arrested in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Peter takes out his sword and chops off the ear of the uh, servant of the high priest. And, you know, what Jesus puts the ear back on. And even, even after Jesus dies, and he's resurrected, and it's it, Acts 1, he's ascending into heaven, and Jesus says, now wait, power is going to fall upon you. And he's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the disciples, they still don't get it. And they said, Jesus, is that when you're going to restore the kingdom? Is that when you're going to overthrow everything and, and kind of set up your, you know, your worldly kingdom? They just didn't get it. Even after everything, they didn't get it. But then when God's Spirit did fall on Pentecost, they got it. They finally understood Jesus. They understood his mission. Uh, they understood his purpose. And they understood what the calling was on their life. And they were changed from the inside out. What happens to the disciples after the Spirit comes on Pentecost? They become righteous. They become humble. And then they're preaching. They invite the whole world to come to Jesus in faith. Uh, you know, this kingdom invitation. And even on the first day of the church on Pentecost, the message goes out to those who are responsible, who are directly responsible for putting Jesus on the cross. They're crossing every line, every boundary, inviting them into salvation. They're not worried about being right and, and calling out who was wrong. They're interested about making things right for the kingdom. And so by their actions, the gospel spreads, right? Uh, that's the story of the New Testament and the story of, of civilization. It goes to many worlds, uh, you know, all, every corner of the world. And, and really, they set the world on fire with their message of Christ. Now, in time, the Roman Empire would embrace Christianity. Uh, the, remember the ones that, you know, all the Israelites wanted Jesus to kill and overthrow? In time, the Roman Empire adopts and embraces Christianity. And it had been won over by the blood of the martyrs and by the testimony of the church. Now compare this, this beautiful spread of the gospel through righteous, gentle, you know, a peace bringing uh, approach versus what would happen later. The darkest moment in the, in the history of the church were the Crusades, where the church would take up the swords, uh, sword and, and go on a killing spree in the name of Jesus. Um, you know, the world doesn't need another crusade. <laughs> Uh, from the church. And, and, and this is so important for us as we talk about representing Jesus, because if we don't get this right, the world has no chance of meeting Jesus, the real Jesus, the, the gentle, righteous, humble Jesus. We have to get this right. And, and we've got to check ourselves. Are we representing Jesus 
uh, in, in, as just this kind of like the next power hungry leader, warmonger um, that's heavily tied to the ideology of a political party or our own personal views? Or, or is he something completely different? Something the world has never known or seen before? A righteous, gentle, humble king who comes to bring peace to the whole world. Now, I'll finish by saying this. The crowd on Palm Sunday, they were, they were right about something. Um, this, their timing was way off. That scripture ends, the story of scripture ends with Jesus returning on a horse, on a war horse, uh, you know, and, and finally dealing with every enemy of the kingdom of God. And there will be judgment and there will be an overthrowing of the evil and the violence um, and, and the sin of the world. And it will be eternally punished. Uh, and he will finally and in every way make things right. And he's coming. He's coming as that king. But until then, until that time comes, uh, what are you and I supposed to be doing? Um, gracefully, lovingly, honestly, compassionately, and consistently sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and shining the light on that gentle Savior coming up over the hill on a donkey, weeping for a, a lost city. That is the Christ that you and I are to bring and to share and to introduce to the whole world.